I'm very excited to have William Mann with us. William Mann has written a phenomenal new book called The Knights Templar in the New World, How Henry Sinclair Brought the Grail to Arcadia. Now, you have heard from people like Stephen Sora on this program, the author of The Lost Treasure of the Knights Templar, and a number of others. We're all, as I am, fascinated with the true history of our lost past and this show is going to be about the best you've ever heard on this subject. Very simpler, simply because Bill Mann is, the book is the best book ever written on the subject. Uh, Bill, uh, his great uncle was a supreme grand master of the Knights Templar of Canada. And he received, Bill received the keys that would eventually unlock the mystery of the Templars in Canada. Uh, from his his uh, uncle, great uncle, Bill. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Whitley, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm I'm amazed at uh, the reaction that I am getting out of the book, and I'm excited uh, not only for the reader, but uh, also excited for myself because it's something of uh, a mystery unto myself that I. I really wanted to share with a number of readers. Well, you know, of course, you and I go back because of the fact that you we tried to publish this book. Yes, in, of course. In Whitley Strieber's Hidden Agenda series, uh, but the publisher did not. They did not understand the series. They uh, sh they were doing a lot of things that weren't right. Among them was the decision that they made that this book was not of interest to the readers. And the series failed because they they just they didn't understand what they were doing. And uh, I have to tell you, reading it again, I was just, I th you've polished it, first of all, uh, uh, s since I last read it. And it's wonderful. And I, I, what I want to do is I want to start out with, in the forward, in Michael Bradley's forward, there is such a succinct description of who the Templars were. So let's go back to the to the to the beginnings of it, to the Albigensians, and 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 start from there, and then we'll go forward. Okay. Um, first of all, let me just say that Michael Bradley, as you mentioned, I think he was uh, one of the first to really make this connection between the Knight Templar and the possibility that Prince Henry St. Clair brought with him uh, what he terms to be the Holy Grail. Uh, to Nova Scotia. As uh, I continued through the book, as I started the book, what, through a number of things, through a number of family um, mysteries, I was able to piece together uh, one fact that I thought was uh, was significant, in that Prince Henry St. Clair not only navigated uh, across the northern Atlantic to Nova Scotia 100 years before Columbus, but in actual fact established a settlement there, a settlement of utmost importance because in my mind, that settlement was what I term a grail settlement. Along with 500 Knight Templars that he brought over with him, he established a, a re religious refuge, which acted as a grail settlement, not only uh, from a physical point of view, but from a spiritual point of view also. So in continuing that thought, um, I, th I think it's interesting in that what uh, Michael Bradley does is he, give a, he gives a background in terms of the Knight Templar and their philosophy in life. Following the Albuquerque Crusades, I believe that he, he feels, as I feel, they were the guardians or protectors of a certain spiritual knowledge, uh, knowledge that we refer to as the Grail knowledge, knowledge that uh, was continued unbroken from ancient times uh, prior to the Flood. And I believe that this knowledge was continued through the Knight Templar uh, right through to their uh, possession by their uh, hereditary Grand Master, Prince Henry St. Clair, in the late 1300s. And it was Prince Henry St. Clair... Uh, who under the auspices of the being hereditary Grand Master Knight Templar of Scotland at that time, sailed with 500 of his trusted knights to Nova Scotia. But you know what's so fascinating, endlessly fascinating to, about this to me, is that uh, I met a man in Toronto in 1998, in June of 1998, who was obviously in possession of extraordinary hidden knowledge. And I wrote a little book about this man, about my conversation. It's a transcript, really, of my conversation with him, as I remembered it, called The Key. And one of the things he said, and I know you're going to laugh as a Canadian when you hear this, 
uh, he said, well, I'm Canadian, but I don't pay taxes. And uh, the it, the implication is that he was he must be from a he must have been a, a Canadian. He looked European from before there was a Canada. Conceivably, a still someone of this tradition who still has all of the knowledge intact. Could would, that be true? Oh, very much so. Very much so. I've met through my book. I've met a number of old gentlemen that all claim. <laughs> They all claim to have Canadian heritage, but uh, that also note that they're not Canadian. Uh, prior to Confederation, it's, it's funny, Canadians do not realize that our country was established in 1867, just over 100 years ago. But that before that, there's a real hidden history to throughout Canada, and that hidden history includes the movement of what I believe to be the Grail family and the Grail secret inland um, to areas or surrounding the Great Lakes. And so I very much agree that there are a number of Canadians out there uh, living in Canada who have this hidden history to their family. So, so now, when you say the Grail family, explain exactly what you mean to us. The Grail family obviously picks up on what was uh, what was first released through the uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Basically, right. Lincoln and Lee obviously talk about the Grail family, the direct descendants of Jesus Christ. Uh, even if they don't exist in that form, there are certain families that I believe that possess a, not a divine right, but a, a direct connection to what I would consider to be Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. So it, it's possible that this man that I met was was in some way a, a descendant, and, and if so, this was the incredibly powerful bloodline because this man had uh, really he had the best ideas I've ever heard in my life of any kind. It was the most ethical man I've ever known. His description of sin, for example, denial of the right to thrive. It's an awesome, incredibly ethical few words. You don't hear them. You've never, never heard it defined that way before. It, it was the most amazing conversation I've ever had in my life. And now you're telling me, tell me a little bit more about where you think these families may live. Well, these families live in uh, what is known as Upper Canada. They live in the Ontario area, just north of uh, New York. And uh, in actual fact, I consider my family to be one of those families. These families have been, are steeped in the military Masonic uh, mystique. We're talking about the upper echelons of the uh, the current Knight Templar of Canada. Uh, these families have continued a rather uh, quiet secret in terms of a number of things about the movement of the Grail inland. And uh, I have to let you know that since I wrote the book, I, in fact, have become a Mason myself and have been moved up through the ranks and am currently established as a, as a knight through the Knights Templar of Canada. And yep. I find a number of these gentlemen uh, are positioned uh, in the highest ranks of the Knights Templar of Canada at this time. Now, what happened was in the, in the distant past... Geoffroy de Bouillon was believed to be, by many people in southern France, the direct descendant of Jesus Christ. He carried the blood of Christ in his veins, and his family was considered extremely sacred. Uh, he went to, in the First Crusade, to Jerusalem and conquered Jerusalem. Two orders of knights were formed, the Knights of the Temple of Jerusalem and the, the Knights of St. John, I believe. That's correct. Yeah. And they became the Knights of Malta and the Knights Templar. Now, right. it, shortly, in, about some years after that, and the, and, and the de Bouillon family enjoyed enormous prestige throughout Christendom at this time, but then, eventually, the Saracens retook Jerusalem, and that's when the trouble began for them. Tell us a little bit about what then happened. Well, that's when the uh, that's when there was really a split, a split amongst the philosophies of the various groups. And I believe that uh, if you've read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, they talk about the cutting of the elm at Geyser. And that's where I think that you had two distinct groups established the Knights Templar, and the Priory of Zion. Now, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about the Priory of Zion. Priory of Zion, as it has re-emerged in the 70s. Through a, lo the, a lot of skeptics say that it was actually created in the 70s, that the whole thing is a fake. Well, a number of people pointed that out to me also, but I all, in the research that I've done, I all see that there's, there's an ancient origin. Even if it is a fake, somebody is picking up on some of the ancient clues and instilling them not only within the codes of the Rene's parchment, but also reflecting some of the philosophy that I don't think you could sit around and make up. 
this is the, one of the morals to the story that I try to instill throughout the throughout my book, in that there's a common origin to a lot of this ancient knowledge, to a lot of this ancient philosophy that really couldn't have been made up, that had to come from a single origin. And this is what fascinates me. Uh, again, a moral to the book uh, is that you have to look beyond the obvious. You have to look to the origin. And uh, that origin, I believe, the, the entire secret has been lost because of the splitting of this knowledge. And there are certain clues out there within various groups that current uh, uh, modern-day groups that are now trying to lay claim to that they're the uh, possessors of these uh, secret uh, uh, teachings. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. The Knights Templar in the New World, how Henry Sinclair brought the grail to Arcadia, but more importantly, who was the grail? It was not a cup. It was a family and that family very possibly gave us most recently the master of the key extraordinary stuff from William Mann get it from the unknowncountry.com bookstore William Henry is making a special offer in the William Henry section of the unknowncountry.com store anything you buy there any order comes with a free DVD of his incredible Stargate lecture. It's a 1995 value. It is absolutely free, one per order, as long as supplies last. Buy any William Henry book, or any or all of the William Henry books, and you will get a free DVD thrown in. You can't beat that. It's a great offer from William Henry. So go to the unknowncountry.com store and get into William Henry. Well worth doing for your spirit and for your mind, as well as for a free DVD. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back I'm talking to Bill Mann, William Mann, the Knights Templar in the New World, how Henry Sinclair brought the grail to Arcadia. Awesome, awesome information is coming through here, folks. Uh, maybe we're getting the key to who the master of the key was and is, and I'm thinking that maybe I'll make another trip to Canada soon and try to see if I can find him among these families that William is talking about. Now, William, before you, we left the air, we were t you were talking about this information being split in half and the secret being lost. What exactly are the two halves? The two halves, I believe, are, one, you have to treat this on two levels. There's a physical level. Physical level, I believe, was uh, relating to a number of ancient maps, ancient maps which Knights Templar uh, possessed and which allowed them to virtually circumnavigate the world at a time when the uh, the formal church was uh, teaching that uh, you fell off the end of the earth as you passed through the pillars of Hercules. Uh, then there's the spiritual context. The spiritual context, I believe, relates to this notion of the Holy Family, the Holy Grail, the uh, possible union of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, and the resulting uh, direct descendants of the... Uh, Holy Family, the Grail Family, as I refer to them. I think those are the two main secrets. But again, what I've tried to point out in my book, I don't think that this is the absolute secret. I think the absolute secret goes beyond, goes beyond uh, to, to the origin of ancient knowledge. Masonic tradition talks about the continuation, of this continual line of knowledge prior to the flood, prior to uh, Noah and the flood. Well, and I believe it's this is some of this knowledge that is reflected in modern ritual, although I'm being known to most Masons, uh, that is part of the secret. Give us an idea of some of this knowledge, what you think it might involve. What I think uh, one of the most important aspects of this knowledge it was the ability in ancient times, through the ancient mariners were able to establish both longitudinal and latitudinal uh, meridians around the world. And in that manner, it allowed them, uh, very much like the Greeks, to confirm that the earth was round, but also to circumnavigate the world as such and to trade with the uh, 
uh, native Indians in both North and South America. Think about it. If you had an unlimited supply of trade, including gold and other raw minerals, which uh, lent to your steelmaking and uh, ore making abilities and gold collecting abilities, to me this would be immense wealth and immense power, something that I believe even the church would follow you around the world to try to obtain. That's fascinating. And, uh... and in my second book that I'm working on right now, tentatively called The Grail Meridian, I believe that I've established uh, this ancient longitudinal um, sequence of meridians uh, across North America. And then Prince Henry Sinclair's one of his tasks was to bring along with the, uh, a variety of relics, a variety of treasures with him on his voyage in 1398, a number of chests which he would use as talismans to to reactivate this grid system across North America through the aid of the Micmac Indians. Good Lord. Now, and, and now, why? Do, how do the Micmac Indians come into this? Well, the Micmac Indians, or the Mi'kmaq, as they're known now, uh, were the local tribe of Indians in Nova Scotia that would have greeted uh, Prince Henry St. Clair. Now, there's a number of stories or legends... And conceivably refer- intermarried. And conceivably intermarried, very much so. I don't know. My wife is from Nova Scotia, and uh, to meet some of the Mi'kmaq Indians in Nova Scotia, you would think that they're more Scottish than Scottish. They're red-haired, blue-eyed, freckles. There, there obviously is intermarriage between the earlier Scots and, and, the, and, and, the, and the transfer, therefore, also probably of knowledge. Absolutely. Absolutely. My word. And there are a number of legends, Micmac uh, legends, uh, about the man-god Blue's Gap, which a fellow, an American, by the way, Frederick Pohl, in 1950, he was able to translate a number of these uh, legends pointing to the fact and relating it to the Zeno narrative, which is a narrative... Uh, which was written in the 1500s about Prince Henry St. Clair's voyage, and uh, identify a number of factors that could only relate Prince Henry St. Clair himself and the Templars. This is fascinating. Uh, tell me, t- tell me more. G- can you expand on this a little certainly, bit? Certainly. Go, well, wait a minute. We've got to come. We're coming to the end of okay. to another break here. So, uh, instead of telling me more right now. William, William Mann's going to tell me more in just a couple of seconds. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland, and we will be right back. The Knights Templar in the New World, how Henry Sinclair brought the grail to Arcadia, but more importantly, who was the grail? It was not a cup. It was a family, and that family very possibly gave us most recently the master of the key extraordinary stuff from William Mann get it from the unknowncountry.com bookstore This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We are talking to Bill Mann, William Mann, the author of The Knights Templar in the New World, How Henry Sinclair Brought the Grail to Arcadia, a beautiful book, by the way, a wonderful cover on it. It's got illustrations throughout the book, and uh, uh, but more than that, this is real secret knowledge here from a man who is related by blood to some of the living Templars of Canada. And I am, you're blowing my mind, Bill. I have to tell you, just very frankly, it's not often that I end up in a situation where I've got so many questions I can't even figure out which one to ask next. (laughs) Uh, This is, the reason is, of course, I think I've been exposed to this knowledge that that, that a member of this family, of, of one of these families, sought me out in Toronto in 1998 and gave me the information that became my book, The Key. And I, I think that this man, I might even be able to find him up there. But let's go back to the Micmacs and to the secret knowledge that they have. Certainly, Whitley. You mentioned that this man in Canada that you talked with, 
how he exuded a uh, rather thoughtfulness and gentleness. And any of the people very definitely I, the people that I meet are absolute gentlemen. They're very reflective. It's as though they possess a sense of God, a sense of spirit within them. And that's what, well, that, and that's that's exa- what my great uncle was all about. That's exactly what this man was like. It was absolutely awesome. It, it, he was, he was, uh, there was something about him that was almost like you, like a light that was high, brighter, higher than you could see was glowing talk- out of him. We're talking about an aura of knowledge. Y- yes. But there's also a sense of calmness. Now, you have to understand that I virtually grew up in a home very much like that. Uh, my father was the oldest of 15. I had uh, seven uncles, and I had uh, seven great uncles who all were had military backgrounds. And for people that had military backgrounds and that had experienced the horrors of war, I was just amazed at the calmness that, re- that surrounded them. And you have to appreciate that my great uncle, who uh, was the one who was the Supreme Grand Master and Knight Templar in the 50s, and who showed me this secret, he exuded this calmness, just this amazing calmness, to the point that it was almost surreal. And he would go around, and one thing he would do is he would challenge my mind all the time. We lived in Brantford, which is about 60 miles west of Toronto, and he would, he would come and visit on the long weekends, and he would thrill me with just little puzzles with little mind teasers, very intellectual uh, presence about them. They were always challenging you to think. It, they were always questioning you the reason. And very much so, as I point out my, in my book, the Knights Templar really practiced this. They practiced the art of reasoning. They were, they were the ones who were able to reason that there is a supreme being or to reason that there is a higher spiritual level versus taking it on blind faith. And I think this is one of the things that uh, in medieval times that really challenged the church. The Knights Templar, following Cathar thought, uh, really uh, promoted this direct contact with God, specifically if you went to the wilderness and if you uh, if you sat in a cave, uh, very much like uh, one of their uh, one of their saints, Saint, Saint, Hen- Saint Anthony. Mm-hmm. But what the, what they profounded or professed to have was this direct contact or direct circuit to God through the very essence or through the very spirit of living. And I and very much so if we come full circle to Prince Henry St. Clair sailing to Nova Scotia and meeting up with the Micmac Indians, Micmac legend describes Glooscap as a man of honor, as a man of few words, but a, a, as a man of compassion and intelligence. And this is what really has surprised me as such. I can almost spot, as you say, spot the the higher echelon Knights Templar here in Canada when I meet them, just by their presence, just by the calmness that they exude. There really is something. I've I've asked a number of gentlemen, how can I make these connections? And they say, my dear boy, do not worry about it. It's in your blood. Now, what... um why aren't you one of these people? I'm not sure if I am. And yet you're doing something very different. They obviously keep to themselves. They do. And one of them came out and created the key. I'm I'm quite sure now as we're talking that it must have been one of these people. Um, the the uh, And then you've done this, The Knights Templar in the New World, a book of, in many ways, just as profound because it is so incredibly illuminating it's almost as if this this secret and exalted strain of mankind is actually emerging right now that's correct the timing is right why is dan dan brown's book the da vinci code gaining so much success because people are hungry and thirsty for this exactly exactly they're looking for something else and I find, and as I say, I've talked to these uh, these older gentlemen, and they say, continue what you're doing. I think they realize also now is the time for there, there should be some exposure of this knowledge because they realize that people are searching for something, searching searching for something that the, uh, the formal church really can't offer them, this understanding of the spirit that is within all of us, I believe. 
And uh, think about it. This spirit allowed Prince Henry St. Clair and the Knights Templar and all those ancient mariners that came before them to virtually sail around the world. Yes. It must, it, it must be in such a strong sense of understanding, of understanding that they, their forefathers went before them. They and knew in, where they were, and, and the vast majority of people in those days did not know this. Exactly, and this is one of the points that I was trying to point out in my book. Prince Henry St. Clair knew exactly where he was going. Now, it was more of a puzzle. There's a puzzle, as you can appreciate when you read the book. The puzzle is to the initiate. When he gets to Nova Scotia, he has to go through this puzzle, through this geometric progression. It's almost a challenge to him in order to identify the, uh, the settlement that I've identified uh, in Nova Scotia through this geometric progression and application of moral allegory, which in, in actual fact are the two main principles of modern-day Freemasonry. Now, when you go physically to where the settlement was, what do you find? What do I find? There's, mm -hmm. there's a, a stone rubble within the, within the woods itself. I have a narrow photo that very clearly identifies a number of circle depressions uh, within a, an abandoned field. Uh, I've shown that to a good friend of mine who's a professor of archaeology. He feels that what I've discovered or rediscovered is a Celtic earth fort. So this ties back into this notion that in actual fact, Prince Henry St. Clair, who was Earl of Orkney, uh, part, of the, part of Norway at that time, that in actual fact, he was following in the footsteps of the Vikings before him, of his Norse forefathers. And there's a number of clues within the landscape itself that depict uh, the landform has actually changed. And we're talking prior to the uh, arrival of the Acadians in the early 1600s. The, the landform itself changed. Yes. The creek has been altered. There's a creek in a valley that's been altered. In the actual fact, it depicts uh, a number of figures uh, from the Bible, from Ezekiel, the, the uh, figures that were identified through Ezekiel's dream. And this was one way, again, you have to see on a spiritual level how Prince Henry Sinclair and his followers, what they were looking to do was reestablish this grail community, which would in actual fact be heaven on earth. So physically, the site that identifies Nova Scotia obviously offers a variety of mineral resources. It's located in Annapolis Valley, which has a very temperate climate uh, where you could harvest two crops a year. It was perfect for an agricultural operation, but on a spiritual level, it, w it would be considered remembering that these fellows came from northern Scotland, where the weather and the Black Plague uh, wasn't too good at the time. Right. The, the atmosphere that they must encounter, especially encountering the very friendly Indians, which, which would have gone a long ways to, to helping them establish the settlement right. and, and allowing to them to explore inland, would have given them the, a spiritual lift to such that they must have thought, felt that they were heaven on earth in the Elysian Plains. Now, this is, you know, I have to ask you, as I read the book, I, there were so many things that, that, uh, that... So came, many connections. Co connections, yeah. They're, they're fascinating, absolutely fascinating connections. I want... I would like to hear your take on Mary Magdalene and exactly who she was. I, maybe the best way to do that is to ask you uh, why you title that chapter concerning her, Mary Mary, quite contrary. Uh, other than just trying to be clever there, I think, it, I think it's interesting because obviously what's coming out nowadays in numerous books is that Mary took on a different persona, the uh, physical persona, than what was portrayed by the formal church and what we read in the Gospels. I think a number of people have hit it uh, right on the right on the head in that Mary, I believe, in actual fact, she was probably a royal family, comparable to Jesus Christ. She was the Egyptian royal priestess of the temple, and I think it was through Mary Magdalene 
that she introduced a number of the mysteries or teachings to Christ. It's interesting in that uh, in some modern-day uh, Templar ritual, they acknowledge Christ as the prophet, Christ as the king, but also Christ as the man. And from my point of view, that philosophy does not take anything away from Christ possessing the divine right. In actual fact, if Christ indeed did marry Mary, Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene, to me it just reinforces what I want to achieve, what I want to reflect from, uh, you know, in, during my personal life towards the teachings of Christ. Um, I don't think it lessens his teachings in any manner to think that Christ is, was purely a man. And I don't think it lessens the, in any manner that he did uh, marry Mary Magdalene and uh, have a family. But obviously Mary Magdalene had a higher status than afforded through the gospel. To me, she was she was a royal blood herself. To me, she was probably the priestess, the high priestess of the temple. And it was through her this uh, there was the coming together of the male female relationship, which allowed them to achieve and to experience certain mysteries. And I think and I think that's a beautiful story. Having a lovely wife myself, and yeah, me too. And two very trying teenage boys right now. I think <laughs> I, I think that's the I think that's the the moral to the story. What about the idea that the bloodline? that the blood itself may have genetically encoded knowledge in it. There, a lot of the books have come out on that, uh, on that fact, and I really wouldn't doubt that there is that, uh, that happening uh, or that instance. But again, I, a lot of people ask me about that, and they center on that, Whitley, and I, and I, don't, wanna, I don't want to lessen the importance of that, but... You have to appreciate it from a Templar point of view, and I've always come at it from a Templar point of view. If the Templars were, in actual fact, accused as being the guardians of this holy family, they would have assumed that position to disguise their real activities. And to me, their real activities was, on a more physical level, I believe that they possessed the knowledge of this unlimited wealth in the new world. And we're going to find out more about what, just what that unlimited wealth might have been in a couple of minutes. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. The Knights Templar in the New World, how Henry Sinclair brought the grail to Arcadia, but more importantly, who was the grail? It was not a cup. It was a family, and that family very possibly gave us most recently the master of the key extraordinary stuff from William Mann get it from the unknowncountry.com bookstore William Henry is making a special offer in the William Henry section of the unknowncountry.com store anything you buy there any order comes with a free DVD of his incredible Stargate lecture. It's a 1995 value. It is absolutely free, one per order, as long as supplies last. Buy any William Henry book, or any or all of the William Henry books, and you will get a free DVD thrown in. You can't beat that. It's a great offer from William Henry. So go to the unknowncountry.com store and get into William Henry. Well worth doing for your spirit and for your mind, as well as for a free DVD. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back. We're talking to William Mann, Bill Mann, the Knights Templar in the New World, one of the most fascinating conversations I've had in a long time. We are discussing the presence of the Knights Templar as a community, a still-living community in Canada, and I am of course, fascinated with the fact that there seems to be a profound relationship between the knowledge that Bill has been uncovering and the people he has found 
and the master of the key who told me so many extraordinary things on that night in a hotel room in Toronto in 1998. So it's a tremendously exciting conversation for me, and I'm sure for you, too. Uh, now, Bill, just let's just continue where we were when we left the air. Okay. I'm going to mention one word to you. A lot of people ask me, well, it's obvious. They say it's obvious that the Knights Templar were coming here for the gold. When I mean coming here, I mean along the northeastern seaboard in the Appalachian Mountains in Nova Scotia. Obviously, there was an immense uh, quantity of gold to be had. I believe, and this is really interesting, that the Knights Templar possessed the knowledge to mine titanium. Now, what would they do with titanium? You have to remember, how did the Knights Templar defeat the Saracens in the First Crusade? Because they possessed the world's greatest still-making ability. Titanium now has been discovered, just recently discovered, I think it's just recently been rediscovered in the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia. And in actual fact, the site that I identify has some of the highest concentrations of titanium in the world. It is a very rare metal, but what it does is if mixed right through steel-making abilities, certain steel-making abilities, it produces what's known as a light blue steel, a blue steel that is harder and lighter than any steel in the world. And in actual fact, the U.S. military, any military throughout the world right now, uh, most of their weapons, including tanks, uh, I believe the space shuttle, is made out of titanium. Think about it. If the Knights Templar possessed this secret catch of titanium, which allowed them, through their steel-making abilities, to possess the lightest and strongest steel in the world, obviously they would be the most formidable uh, uh, war machine of their time. And this is in part why I believe that they layered the secret of the new world, how to get to the new world, under a variety of layers of this esoteric uh, knowledge, uh, which they were accused of. The best thing to do is if you're accused of esoteric knowledge, uh, by an esoteric knowledge by the church, is to assume it to disguise your real activities. And this is the one of the points that I make in my book. If you're accused of being guardians of the uh, the holy, holy family, grail family, why not use that to disguise your real activities? Of course, this is where this is where the two two mix. I believe that Prince Henry St. Clair and his Templars did in fact bring members or descendants of the Grail family with them uh, to their settlement in Nova Scotia. But again, I think that was to disguise their real activities. Uh, the site that I've identified, I've been able to confirm that in actual fact there was an old mining site underneath the uh, underneath the mountain. And uh, in actual fact, I've just, uh, at this point in time, made a, a mineral claim through the Nova Scotia government uh, to do some mineral exploration to confirm the amount of titanium and other minerals that are lying in that mountain. Now, let me ask you this. Did Are, are there any titanium steel swords from that era? Yes, there are. There's, uh, I think I'm looking at one on the cover of your book. <laughs> There are there are Scottish titanium swords in the uh, in the Niven Sinclair Memorial uh, Library and Museum in Nosthead in the north of Scotland. And it's funny, um, I phoned Niven Sinclair. Now the Sinclairs obviously are people that have this this direct bloodline. Yeah, I knew John Niven. Sinclair. Yeah, and Niven Sinclair is uh, a beautiful again a beautiful gentleman. He's about 80 years old, lives out of London, uh, England, and he's one of the major proponents behind trying to uh, get Prince Henry St. Clair brought to the forefront. And he and I have carried on a, a, a great conversation and friendship for the last 10 years. The first thing I asked him when I realized this, uh, this presence of titanium, I said, do you know of any artifacts that are made of pure titanium? And he come back to me, and he says, in the museum in Rhodes, Richard II's uh, necklace, there's a cross within his necklace. 
Wow. Is made of pure titanium. We're going to come right back and talk more about this fascinating discovery. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. The Knights Templar in the New World, how Henry Sinclair brought the grail to Arcadia, but more importantly, who was the grail? It was not a cup. It was a family, and that family very possibly gave us most recently the master of the key extraordinary stuff from William Mann. Get it from the unknowncountry.com bookstore. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're talking to Bill Mann, William Mann, the Knights Templar in the New World, how Henry Sinclair brought the grail to Arcadia. Completely awesome. Completely awesome stuff. No other way to describe it. We're talking about the mystery of titanium steel and how it turned up in the hands of Knights Templar. Uh, Bill, where else Besides Nova Scotia or the New World, could they have gotten titanium at the period we're talking about, the, I guess, the 13th century? I believe there are only two other areas of titanium in the world that they would have been able to obtain uh, at that point in time. There's one down in Brazil, and interesting enough, a number of the colleagues that I've been conversing with lately have identified, in fact, a temper presence down in Brazil. Wow. And, and unbeknownst to a lot of people, and even me, that uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil was a Templar community until about 1827, I believe. And so there's a lot of this uh, symbology that I've identified that this, that can be found in the landscape that is evident in Brazil. I also believe that somewhere in uh, in Georgia and Russia there is a titanium... Uh, deposit that uh, that is rather large and rather accessible. Titanium so in, is. A, let's just try, do a little sideline here. It, the presence of Templars in Brazil maybe also would explain the presence, the mysterious presence of the Templar battle flag uh, among the so-called pirates of the Spanish Main, the Caribbean. When the Spaniards came to the Caribbean, these pirates kind of appeared out of nowhere and began harassing their their ships, and they carried, of course, the Jolly Roger, which was uh, very similar to the Templar battle flag. Absolutely. Absolutely. And interesting enough, um, on my trip to Scotland, uh, I met a number of Mi'kmaq Indians. The Mi'kmaq flag is reflective of almost exactly like the Templar uh, flag, the, the seagoing flag. It's the it's it's amazing. It's the St. George's Cross sort of on the side. Wow. With, with a star and a moon, red and white, all of the Templar colors. So yes, and a lot of this a lot of this piracy that went on in the uh, 16th and 17th century, I'm sure was a reflection of earlier Templar activity, because the British at that time were starting to amalgamate. Uh, Scottish masonry, English masonry, and all of these clues would have then started coming together. And this really explains, I explain in my book, I'm amazed that the, uh, the veracity and the ruthlessness that the British in 1755 expelled the Acadians out of Nova Scotia. And the Acadians, if anybody's listening to Acadians and appreciates it, the Acadians were expelled to Louisiana and a number of places in the southern states. Uh, the first um, the first love of my life was an Acadian from Lafayette, Louisiana. And interesting enough, in Nova Scotia this year is the 400th anniversary of the establishment of the first Acadian settlement by Samuel de Champlain in 1604. So the Acadians, they were mixed. French Indian blood. Right. A lot of them were Huguenots. They lived in Nova Scotia from the early 1600s to 1755 in relative uh, anonymity. Even when the British took over after the Battle of Culloden, they were allowed to live. But in 1755, 
they were ruthlessly expelled by the British. Now, I believe at that time the British, and you have to remember that most of the high-ranking uh, military officers at that time, like the American Revolution, like the Americans, were all Masons. I believe that they had an inkling that the Templar treasure still lay in Acadia, being New Scotland or Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And this is the, one of the reasons that they expelled the Acadians. And all, all of those who settled on the, far, the Acadian farms after that were the Irish, Scottish, and British soldiers that had just been retired. And they were all Masons. So they were put there as spies, I believe to try to, in a very quiet way, to try to rediscover this Templar treasure, or at least rediscover signs of Templar movement uh, from 1398, from the 1400s, by Prince Henry St. Clair, and those who came before him. And it's interesting enough, as you mentioned, the, the fellow that you met in 1999, I believe. 1998. 1998, the Canadian fellow. Yeah. We're, we're a little different than the state. Canada is always seen, now it's gotten us into trouble, I believe, right about now, but we've, we've always been seen as being a sanctuary or a refuge. Right. Where did that come from? Where does that, where does that philosophy come from? It was almost as though that's been continued from the early 1400s and even before. Canada, uh, Nova Scotia, has always been a refuge to the Grail family members. And I think that whole philosophy has permeated our, our political awareness. And I think that's where you have a little bit of difference between who Canadians are and who Americans are, even to this day. Yeah, because this, is, this country is much, much more sort of aggressive in, in its approach to the world than Canada is. That's, that's for sure. I mean, there's that's a right. huge difference in the personalities of the two states. Of course, at the same time, the United States is also more exposed because it's a much, it, it, I mean, I don't mean physically, but geopolitically because it's a bigger economy and a bigger, uh, it has m many, many more different interests and the ability to do much more than Canada does too. Uh, let me, let me get back to what we were discussing earlier on, there seem to be kind of two strains here. One is scientific and, if you will, physical knowledge, such as the knowledge of longitude and latitude, longitude being a, a discovery that, that eluded uh, navigators for a very long time. Uh, the official, really, rediscovery of, uh, discovery of longitude wasn't until the 18th century. That's right. And very made navigation much more difficult uh, in in the past than it than it than it before than after. Without longitude, you have a lot of trouble navigating the world. It's Im not impossible, but it's hard, and it's much more dangerous too, because uh, you can go so far off uh, 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 vertically, as it were, in the world and reach the correct place and still be hundreds or thousands of miles off. But in any case, uh, th that and the mining of titanium and so on and so forth seems to be one strain. But then I listened to what the Master of the Key told me, and this is esoteric knowledge and knowledge about the nature of the soul that's very alchemical in the one sense because he speaks of them as radiant bodies and things, and he speaks of them as a very much, he says at one point that they're part of the physical universe, that there is no supernatural uh, that, that's just a part of the, there's a physical universe that we understand and a physical universe that we don't understand. And uh, 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 these, this is a completely different strain of knowledge. It's, it is a completely different strain of knowledge. Yeah. But I believe it goes hand in hand. The awareness, uh, the spiritual awareness of yourself and the, your surroundings obviously allows you to become more aware of the, the physical bearing that you find within the earth. So, you know, the the exposure of titanium, the availability of, got, of gold, they not only they not only um, explored for these minerals on a physical level, but I believe, uh, whether you call them uh, alchemists or, or whatever, I believe that spiritually they had the ability to divine those minerals. Very much you would have the ability to divine water sources. Right. 
and I believe to that they... to divine them. My wife had a a dowser on sure. the other week on uh, her program, Mysterious Powers, and I was very interested in this interview. I think this man knew more than he was saying about the whole, the power of that whole process. Certainly, certainly. What do you know about it? Well, I divine myself, um, but I do it on a little oh. different level. Uh, when people are looking for sewers, they're looking for water pipes, I'm usually the one that can get out with the coat hangers and find them. It, it's, again, an ability to tap into your inner self to, to realize the earth's uh, sources and energy. And these are some things that I, something that I believe Prince Henry St. Clair and some of his most trusted knights, they also had those abilities. Now I mentioned, um, interesting enough, Rosalind Chapel. We haven't talked about Rosalind Chapel. I believe in Rosalind Chapel, uh, just south of Edinburgh, there's a carved story within the stone that speaks to Prince Henry St. Clair and his knights coming to the New World. And part of that, and it has it has things in it like uh, ears of corn uh, exactly. carved into it, and so it's obvious they came to the New World. Exactly, but there are some other things. There are a number of cubes. What oh, they listen, call we've come to the end of this segment. Uh, we'll be right back. The Swidley Street Rich Dreamland. William Henry is making a special offer in the William Henry section of the UnknownCountry.com store. Anything you buy there, any order comes with a free DVD of his incredible Stargate lecture. It's a 1995 value. It is absolutely free, one per order, as long as supplies last. Buy any William Henry book or any or all of the William Henry books, and you will get a free DVD thrown in. You can't beat that. It's a great offer from William Henry. So go to the unknowncountry.com store and get into William Henry. Well worth doing for your spirit and for your mind, as well as for a free DVD. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're talking to William Mann. We're having a, a wonderful time today. There's no other way to describe it. This is such a cool book, The Knights Templar in the New World. Do get yourself a copy. I hope you'll get it from the unknowncountry.com bookstore. If not, get it somewhere. But for goodness sakes, go out and get this thing because this is... This is the kind of knowledge that you and I are here for. This is what we hunger and thirst for. What really did happen in the past, and therefore, what? who are we and what do we really mean? We live in a world that is fighting all real knowledge of who and what we are, is ultimately fighting the true power of Christ. Uh, if you t want to talk about it, heresies, everything that came after the Templars is heresy. It's all heresy. But the truth is definitely out there, and I am talking to a man whose own bloodline is part of that truth. Not only that, his knowledge, his ability to divine these things, uh, to use esoteric means as well as Hard science and scholarship is just extraordinary. It's really an awesome experience to talk to you, Bill. And, uh, now, let's get back to Rosalind Chapel. Thank you, Whitley. Uh, Rosalind Chapel, to me, it's always amazing. I visited it a number of occasions. It amazes me. I can always tell the old masons. They walk in there, and there's the apprentice pillar, which is a magnificently carved pillar. They will stand there, and they will look at the pillar for hours. What they fail to look at are those things beyond the pillar, around the pillar. But to me, the most fascinating thing about Rosalind Chapel is not the chapel itself, although virtually every stone is carved and has esoteric meaning. I went down in the River Esk, down in the river valley below the chapel. Below the chapel on the, uh, on the river banks are a number of caves which have pick drawings in those caves, 5,000, 6,000 years old. And to me, the moral of the story is Rosalind Chapel is built upon earlier foundations of knowledge, of spirituality. And I think this was the whole philosophy of the Templars. They possessed or rediscovered 
an unbroken line of this ancient knowledge. And that unbroken line is conveyed in the carvings of Roslyn Chapel. Now, the one fascinating thing that I found in Roslyn Chapel, there are these cute, what they call the cubes of Roslyn Chapel. And they are found at the end of arches. And uh, I have a, a CD-ROM set. I forget how many variations of cubes there are. Um, there must be a mathematical sequence to them. But in essence, there's 12 basic cubes, which are reflective of chess. Now, the story goes that, that Sinclair brought 12 ships over with him, with his 500 Templars. Right. And in each of these ships, acting as a talisman, was one of these chests. Now, these chests supposedly contained relics, possibly of the Holy Family. They contained, uh, obviously, relics maybe from the, uh, the sacking of the Temple of Solomon. They contained written manuscripts, possibly from the Library of Alexandria, and possibly they contained genealogies, you know, direct Gospels of Christ and Mary Magdalene. They contained a number of things, obviously, that the church would have loved to get their hands on. And this is where I think that Prince Henry St. Clair brought, his mission was to bring these relics with them to Nova Scotia and to reestablish these, this longitudinal meridian grid across North America. And I, by burying those at various now, when you say long, longitudinal meridian grid, yes. what exactly are you referring to here? Well, the site that I've established in Nova Scotia lies on a certain grid, and I've been able to determine that for every eight degrees in longitude, the grid continues across North America. And interesting enough, when, once I've done this, you can run north-south on those grids, and those grids usually fall across uh, small communities no, named Meridian, and and so there's a suggestion that there is this ancient Meridian grid uh, across North America, a pressure point, and Thomas Jefferson in Washington, I think, tied into a little bit of this in the establishment of Washington and Monticello. Now, would this relate to things like the divining that you were talking about earlier? Ab- absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And these would and I know all of this, folks, by the way, because it's all in the book. I have to tell you. I mean, we're not talking about anything that's not discussed. So. Yeah. And these would and these would have been obviously earlier spiritual areas. Right. Of the of local native. Identifying these places of power was very important to the Templars. Very much so. Very much so. Okay, we're coming to the end of our time together. We've just got a couple of seconds left. I want to thank you so much, Bill. It was it was <laughs> so cool. This you're, wel- you're welcome. Very much. Oh yeah, this book, uh, the Knights Templar in the New World, wonderful stuff. Uh, awesome that this. Extraordinary hidden knowledge is resurfacing now. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. One reporter who loves mysteries is radio's leading science journalist, Linda Moulton Howe. She's an Emmy Award winning TV producer, documentary filmmaker, and writer, and the reporter and editor for EarthFiles.com, the Internet's most respected edge science website. Today, she has a special report for us on two things. First, some amazing pictures of an apparent alien that may be authentic from Holland. Second, that stunner of a UFO video that has been made by the Mexican Air Force. Here she is from Philadelphia, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. Because Mexico is so much international news, I thought I would lead off with that today and then go to the amazing images and videotape in Holland. Uh, This started on April 20th in Mexico City when independent TV producer and journalist Jaime Masson, who has worked in Mexico City media for 32 years, received a call from Mexico's Secretary of Defense Office That would be like me getting a call from Donald Rumsfeld. Jaime went the next day on April 21st to meet with General Clemente Vega Garcia, Secretary of Defense, and his staff. One of General Garcia's challenges is to stop narcotics trafficking. He told Jaime that on March 5th, 
2004, Mexican Air Force pilots in the 501st Aerial Squadron were flying to look for airplanes trying to smuggle drugs near Ciudad del Carmen in the state of Campeche. The Mexican Air Force plane was equipped with what is called FLIR, which is forward-looking infrared, and radar. In the war on drugs, infrared cameras are used all the time to photograph the heat from airplanes trying to fly at night without navigation lights to avoid police. Well, on March 5th, the FLIR camera recorded on mini-DVD videotape several aerial objects that were invisible to the human eye but made bright heat signatures in the infrared. Three objects even showed up on radar indicating reflective mass. Why the rest of the objects did not show up on radar is not known. All of the unidentified objects are still a mystery. It all began when radar showed an object that was moving 37 miles north of the Mexican Air Force plane. The pilot videotaped off and on with the FLIR camera every movement made by the unknown objects over a period of at least 24 minutes and 17 seconds according to the running clock on the FLIR images. I have put many of these images from the infrared videotape and radar at my news website, www.earthbios.com, in chronological clock time order. This Mexico report is at the top of the headlines page and freely accessible to everyone. It's extremely interesting when you look at the images in sequence by time. During the event, at least 11 different objects were together in a single frame. The pilot tried to approach and identify the area of the infrared images, but they maintained distance from the Air Force plane. At one point, though, the objects were seen on the infrared and radar to move closer and surround the military plane, maybe as close as two miles. All the pilots were alarmed to see objects around them on their instruments that they could not see with their eyes. Here now is TV journalist Jaime Masson describing the infrared video that Mexico's Secretary of Defense gave him. What I see in the video tape is uh, a light. You can see the clouds. This is infrared. It's like a black and white. You can see the clouds. Then you can see an object. They chase one object like a little sphere moving uh, 30 miles, 37 miles away from them for, I don't know, probably three, four minutes, five minutes. Then suddenly they they see, you can see in the video, two huge spheres in the middle of the video above the clouds, and they are moving with the airplane. You can see how the spheres go behind the clouds. You can see them passing behind the clouds, proving this is not a reflection. Mm -hmm. And then you can see uh, the uh, all the 11 objects following the two big spheres. Yes? And they, the, the objects are, the, 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 the lights are information. Then, uh, then after that, you see them going through clouds. They follow them like probably three, four minutes. And then you see separated images of these lights standing still. And they said this because they were chasing the plane at the same speed. Hmm. Okay, then, uh, I, I think, uh, Linda, it's, it's very spectacular. Uh, and to explain uh, really in on the scientific basis, this video is going to be very, very difficult for anybody who doesn't want to accept that something is going on. You will see, this is an evidence that is going to be around the world. So many are going to investigate this, and this is probably one of the cases that is going to receive the most attention ever. The, these lights continue moving until they surrounded the plane in the front, in the center, and the back. For that reason, the pilot decided to turn off the light to try to, to avoid any conflict with this object. For some minutes, they felt tension, and they were a little bit afraid, not really threatened, but something unknown. They realized this was not normal. Then the object disappeared, but some of them still still chase the airplane for some more minutes in the back of the airplane moving at the same speed. Uh, for me, that proves
proves that these objects had intelligence. At the same time, had mass because they were recorded with a radar. They had energy because they were, were recorded with the infrared. And at the same time, they were invisible. The pilots and all the crew, eight different elements, weren't able to see these objects uh, when they were no more than two miles away from them. And that was very funny and strange for them because they were able to see them just through the radar, three at the same time, and uh, 11 at the same time with a flare. What you're saying is they could see three objects as solid masses on radar, but they could see 11 objects by heat through the infrared. Exactly. Exactly, but the, the, the objects were the same. The objects were the same. Uh, they were part of the same group, but not all of them were captured by the radar. The radar captured one, then two, then three. Uh, and the, in the infrared, they were able to see two at one moment and then 11 more in a different moment. And that, for that reason, he realized that he was surrounded, but he couldn't see the objects. However, he turned off the lights, the navigation lights, because he thought uh, he had to do something. Uh, he didn't know what was going to happen. It means that proves that he felt some tension. He wasn't imagining this uh, event. Now, in terms of talking with uh, General uh, Ricardo Vega Garcia, Secretary of Defense, who gave you the videotape, did he have any more information by April 22nd after this March 5th event? No. Uh, That's the reason he gave me the tape. He said, we don't know what they are. We have been analyzing them until what we know. I believe he was a very, or he is a very, very honest man. He tried to give me this tape to see what else could I do with it and to present this to the Mexican people. And that uh, hasn't been received very well by the scientific community that said that they should be, they should have received this video before I did. Uh, however, this morning, Secretary of Defense said to all the scientists in Mexico and any scientists that uh, they could have this tape if they like to investigate. They don't have anything to hide. And if this is investigated correctly, we have one of the most solid evidences ever, Linda. Did you ask the general if he had had any discussion or communication with anybody in the United States government about this incident? No, he didn't tell me. Do you I don't think he did. Do you? I, th I think he was acting independently, uh, and at the same time he was trying to be very transparent. We have in Mexico a transparency policy established by the government. I think he was acting according to that policy of the government. That's what I think because he didn't tell me and I couldn't ask things like that. The reason I'm asking is I would assume that the Mexican government would want to make certain that whatever this was flying over the state of Campeche in Mexico was not some advanced technology by the United States. Uh, well, when you don't see them when you don't see these objects, uh, I don't think the general or the government in Mexico could think this was advanced technology of the U.S. because it was simple. That simple reason makes this case a very strange case, uh, Linda. We interviewed the three, the expert of the radar, the expert of the FLIR, and the pilot uh, for... Uh, for a long time. Then they gave me all the information. They were being very honest. I don't think they were lying. The Secretary of Defense authorized them to speak openly to me without without any censorship, which means to me that they were acting uh, in, in the in the with their uh, reality. They were acting on personal basis, telling me exactly what happened. 
And uh, this is why uh, the videotape came to be broadcast on national television in Mexico on Monday night, May 10th, right? Exactly. And how exactly far... because what I wanted to do was to present this to all the Mexican public through the national news that are the most important in this country. After that, I gave a press conference yesterday morning uh, in, inviting everyone that was in Mexico, CNN, ABC, BBC, Reuters, uh, a, uh, AFP, uh, uh, FA, all the international agencies in Mexico and all the Mexican papers and all the rest of the stations in Mexico, Channel 40, Channel 22, uh, Televisión Azteca, uh, Channel 11, all all the media was represented in that press conference. And this material was given freely to them because I understand this belongs to the people. Uh, and then nobody has the right uh, to, 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 to copyright this, this material. Mexican scientists are now trying to dismiss this 24-minute event as either meteorite fragments or ball lightning. But it is my understanding that plasmas will not give the hard returns that are on that radar. Jaime Massan is sending the infrared videotape to other investigators, and if more is learned, I'll report it. Videotapes and photographs of strange phenomena are not only in the skies. Last week, a young man in Holland captured an alien-looking entity on his camera and videotape. More after this break. This is Linda Moulton Howe, reporter and editor of EarthBios.com, reporting for Dreamland. And this is Dreamland with Whitley Strieber. We'll be right back. This is Dreamland with Whitley Strieber. We're back with Linda Moulton Howe. Since 1997, I have reported about the mysterious lights that a young man in Hooven, Holland, has seen literally create crop formations in fields near his home. Physicist Elcho Hasselhoff and BLT researcher Nancy Talbot have investigated those formations and reported anomalies in soil and plants that could not be hoaxed. In the early morning of Thursday, May 6, 2004, that same Robert, now 20, uh, 24 years old and living at his parents' home in Hooven, felt, quote, a very strong mind around me, unquote, and the urge to get his Olympus digital camera and wait in front of a living room chair to photograph whatever appeared. First, Robert saw a faint mist, which he photographed. The mist became denser, and over the next 42 minutes, he took four more photographs. By the fifth photograph shown at earthfiles.com, the mist had formed into an alien-looking figure with large slanted black eyes seeming to sit in the living room chair in front of a framed photograph of the two-year-old son of Robert's oldest sister. Twenty-four hours later, at four o'clock in the morning on Friday, May 7th, Robert took more digital photographs of this alien entity appearing again in the chair. Robert was born on May 7, 1980, so that day was his 24th birthday, and he discovered a crop formation in one of the fields near his home, which he has shown to local radio and TV reporters. Then, another 24 hours later, around 4 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, May 8, Robert felt agitated and could not sleep. In his bedroom, he put his 8 millimeter. this is uh, now analog, VHS videotape camera that he purchased about five years ago, onto a tripod and then waited. In front of his bedroom door, he could see mist again taking shape and began to videotape. The only people who have so far seen this videotape are Robert, his family, and radio reporter Bianca Van Voot, who told me this week that the videotape is, quote, incredible, unquote. I have talked with both Robert and his father, Peter Vandenbroeke, about the experiences, and I asked Peter what his reaction was to seeing his son's videotape. We are very impressed. Wow! How is it possible? Because in the past, when 
other people tell stories about aliens and that sort of things. Well, it was not reality for us. And now my own son in my chair made pictures and uh, there was a figure built up from energy and uh, the last picture he took it was a normal figure <laughs> with eyes in it and that was very special so I believe that uh, screeches um, are, re re are real what do you see on the videotape that he took Sunday yeah yeah, uh, it, it is good to know that it is not a digital tape. It is a normal uh, videotape, right. um, and uh, he, he made the, the the video in his uh, bedroom, and it is uh, dark, uh, and you see uh, a little bit above the ground um, a figure, the same figures as you registrate on the pictures. Well, maybe 50 centimeters tall, and uh, you see only a face, and it is still there, standing, um, and after a few moments, it goes, goes to the right, uh, it looks like that it moves, then it is gone, and a few moments later, it is uh, more bright, more taller, and my opinion is, exactly as the same on the pictures that it takes energy from the house from the environment um, so it can build up to a normal figure and after a few seconds it is gone and it starts again start again with took energy it's my opinion and make the figure stronger and stronger and uh, more bright do you have any intuitive sense at this point about where these creatures originate? No, not at all. Not at all. All what happened is very strange. We are normal persons. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, we didn't know anything about all what is possible. But, uh, well, I have no meaning about, about it. It's so extremely bizarre and all what Robert uh, felt, feels, see uh, in the past, in other lives, uh, in the future, it's always correct. So we believe 100% what he is telling us. And I have no reason uh, don't believe him. Uh, we saw, even as Nancy Talbot in your country, light bulbs in the front of the windows. It was uh, changing very fast it moves very fast it was turning around um, and when you when the balls are coming you felt uh, yeah, booskins how do you call that oh yes goosebumps goosebumps yes. from your tones to your to your head right. and we saw it with our own eyes do you and your wife ever get any impression about what the light balls are? Well, um, I'm not for sure because all what what we think is a message from Robert. But my opinion is that it are a, a, a sort of energy, a sort of energy, and uh, with with a mental brain in it. Right. And uh, well, it is possible that the energy takes forms in bright light balls or transparent light balls of we have more than hundreds of pictures with strange figures uh, from energy so it looks to me it seems to me that it can get forms uh, anyway now uh, it looks like that it built up in the sort of figures now um, he can he can see he can communicate with the other dimension, and if you are here, maybe Robert told you that, um, you make a connection with the other world of what higher is, right. uh, give it a word, and um, take a picture from Robert, and you see Robert with maybe more than 100 light bulbs around his head, uh, maybe if you are here, uh, Robert took a picture from you, take a picture from
from you and next to you, around you, uh, maybe uh, hundreds of light bulbs. Mm -hmm. And it is a sort of energy. I don't know where from, but it is still there. And Anytime. Why? Everywhere where Robert is, the light bulbs are there. And why do you think the light bulbs are making cross circles? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. You listen uh, to the story of Robert, mm -hmm. and his opinion is uh, that uh, there is a sort of message to uh, to the earth to make the earth better, to give the energy positive energy in in, in the network of lines. Uh, but I don't know. And what are you going to do with the videotape? Uh, I keep it as a very, very uh, nice document, but it is a very, very private uh, document. Robert van der Broeke does not speak English very often, but he did try to explain when I asked if he received any telepathic thoughts from the entity as it formed from thin air in the living room chair while he photographed. That's a good question. I was feeling, what I say, a very big mind. I was feeling that there was um, a very big mind, and when they're looking to me, I can feel it. I can feel that there was something, and I heard, yeah, I must say, zoom, mm -hmm. noise. Mm -hmm. But I have not, uh, I have a feeling that I must go out, I must talking about this, serious, it's really reality, and I not, um, I have not talking with the creatures, I have not hearing, hearing sounds. Let me ask you another question about the light bulbs associated with making the crop formations that you have seen with your own eyes. Why do you think the light bulbs have been making these patterns in the fields for so many years? It's, it's so big mystery. It's the big secret from the other dimension. Um, I have a feeling that people, when people see this, that they feel love, they feel lovely, they feel peace. They see it in the patterns, harmony. But when you have crop circles, I have a feeling that the whole world have lines in it and uh, there the are energy lines and and the lines the energy lines um, you have places mm -hmm. you can call it chakras chakras right chakras chakras yes of the air and they are doing something they give an injection with energy and it's going in the network from the whole world and sometimes when you standing off places you can feel it when you are very sensitive you can feel it and I'm sure that many people uh, I know there is more about the crop circles they're helping the people and that's very good and I don't know exactly how it is possible it's 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 so high world so big world it's 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 the secret from god and i, I respect that I, I cannot explain it in both mexico and holland we have the implication of phenomena all around us that we don't normally see with our human eyes and i wonder where this is headed whitley well, Linda, I would like to just make a statement now about what I've just heard regarding the video in Holland. I have had a very similar experience that I have kept secret, at least in part, for years, for nearly 20 years, and I guess about 16 years, because I did not want anyone ever 
to be able to use something I wrote or said to create a hoax. Mm -hmm. Certain things that he said and his father said in their description of what happened convince me this has to be real. Right. Because I have, on a personal basis, had experiences that I have never spoken about that contain elements that are exactly the same as elements that they are describing. Therefore, this means to me that what is out there is now in here, that a bridge has been crossed. Mm -hmm. He was absolutely right in saying that this was in te it was terribly important because it is going to become possible for, for more people to have this happen. And when the visitor said to me many years ago, we will come from within you, this is part of what they meant, but there are more surprises to come. And that it just... Uh reinforces something that he said to me, Robert. He said uh, he expects that the entity is going to continue to come now from wherever it comes to get on more and more photos and videotapes yes. and that he thinks this is leading up to his being in a situation in which a large television station or, or many reporters are going to be able with their own cameras to videotape him with this entity forming so that the world can do it objectively. Well, let me tell you something. This is leading up to the biggest surprise in the history of mankind if it, it continues to evolve and develop. But remember, it's like an arc light. Uh, energy is passing between two, uh, two points because not because of because they're both coming closer together uh, we are beginning to rise and to look up at the same time that somebody else is looking down and we are in terrible trouble on our planet terrible trouble with the environment i know that this emergence is extraordinarily strange incredibly rigorous and profoundly positive for mankind. It's a real gift. And I think that if it, if the arc continues to flare, we are starting a new era of history. He would agree. Linda Moulton Howe, thank you very much for a. I'm very excited to have William Mann with us. William Mann has written a phenomenal new book called The Knights Templar in the New World, How Henry Sinclair Brought the Grail to Arcadia. Now, you have heard from people like Stephen Sora on this program, the author of The Lost Treasure of the Knights Templar, and a number of others. We're all, as I am, fascinated with the true history of our lost past. And this show is going to be about the best you've ever heard on this subject. Very simpler, simply because Bill Mann is, the book is the best book ever written on the subject. Uh, Bill, uh, his great uncle was a supreme grand master of the Knights Templar of Canada. And he received, Bill received the keys that would eventually unlock the mystery of the Templars in Canada. Uh, from his his uh, uncle, great uncle, Bill. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Whitley, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm I'm amazed at uh, the reaction that I am getting out of the book, and I'm excited uh, not only for the reader, but uh, also excited for myself because it's something of uh, a mystery unto myself that I I really wanted to share with a number of readers. Well, you know, of course, it, 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 you and I go back because of the fact that you we tried to publish this book. Yes, in, of course. In Whitley Strieber's Hidden Agenda series, uh, but the publisher did not. They did not understand the series. They uh, sh they were doing a lot of things that weren't right. Among them was the decision that they made that this book was not of interest to the readers, and the series failed because they they just they didn't understand what they were doing. And uh, I have to tell you, reading it again, I was just I th you've polished it first of all uh, uh, since I last read it, and it's wonderful. And I, I, what I want to do is I want to start out 
with in the forward in Michael Bradley's forward, there is such a succinct description of who the Templars were. So let's go back to the to the to the beginnings of it, to the Albigensians, and 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 start from there, and then we'll go forward. Okay. Um, first of all, let me just say that Michael Bradley, as you mentioned, I think he was uh, one of the first to really make this connection between the Knight Templar and the possibility that Prince Henry St. Clair brought with him uh, what he terms to be the Holy Grail uh, to Nova Scotia. As uh, I continue through the book, as I started the book, what, through a number of things, through a number of family um, mysteries, I was able to piece together uh, one fact that I thought was, uh, was significant in that Prince Henry St. Clair not only navigated across the northern Atlantic to Nova Scotia 100 years before Columbus, but in actual fact established a settlement there, a settlement of utmost importance because, in my mind, that settlement was what I term a grail settlement. Along with 500 Knight Templars that he brought over with him, he established a, a re- religious refuge. With- Ideas I've ever heard in my life of any kind. It was the most ethical man I've ever known. His description of sin, for example, denial of the right to thrive. It's an awesome, incredibly ethical few words. You don't hear them. You've never never heard it defined that way before. It it was the most amazing conversation I've ever had in my life. And now you're telling me, tell me a little bit more about where you think these families may live. Well, these families live in uh, what is known as Upper Canada. They live in the Ontario area, just north of uh, New York. And uh, in actual fact, I consider my family to be one of those families. These families have been, are steeped in the military Masonic uh, mystique. We're talking about the upper echelons of the uh, the current Knight Templar of Canada. Uh, these families have continued a rather uh, quiet secret in terms of a number of things about the movement of the Grail inland. And uh, I have to let you know that since I wrote the book, I, in fact, have become a Mason myself and have been moved up through the ranks and am currently established as a, as a knight through the Knights Templar of Canada. And yep. I find a number of these gentlemen uh, are positioned uh, in the highest ranks of the Knights Templar of Canada at this time. Now, what happened was in the in the distant past... Geoffroy de Bouillon was believed to be, by many people in southern France, the direct descendant of Jesus Christ. He carried the blood of Christ in his veins, and his family was considered extremely sacred. Uh, He went to, in the First Crusade, to Jerusalem and conquered Jerusalem. Two orders of knights were formed, the Knights of the Temple of Jerusalem and the, the Knights of St. John, I believe. That's correct. Yeah. And they became the Knights of Malta and the Knights Templar. Now, right. it, shortly, about some years after that, and the, and, and the de Bouillon family enjoyed enormous prestige throughout Christendom at this time, but then eventually the Saracens retook Jerusalem, and that's when the trouble began for them. Tell us a little bit about what then happened. Well, that's when the uh, that's when there was really a split, a split amongst the philosophies of the various groups. And I believe that uh, if you've read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, they talk about the cutting of the elm at Geyser. And that's where I think that you had two distinct groups established the Knights Templar, and the Priory of Zion. Now, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about the Priory of Zion. Priory of Zion, as it has re-emerged in the 70s. Through a, lo- the- a lot of skeptics say that it was actually created in the 70s, that the whole thing is a fake. Well, a number of people pointed that out to me also, but I all in the research that I've done, I all see that there's there's an ancient origin. Even if it is a fake, somebody is picking up on some of the ancient clues and instilling them not only within the codes of the Rene's parchment, but also reflecting some of the philosophy that I don't think you could sit around and make up. This is the, one of the morals to the story that I try to instill throughout the throughout my book in that there's a common origin to a lot of this ancient knowledge which acted as a grail settlement not only uh, from a physical point of view but from a spiritual point of view also. So in continuing that thought, um, I I think it's interesting in that what uh, Michael Bradley does is he he gives a background in terms of the Knights Templar and their philosophy in life. Following the Albuquerque Crusades, I believe that he, he feels, as I feel, they were the guardians or protectors of a certain spiritual knowledge, uh, knowledge that we refer 
refer to as the grail knowledge, knowledge that uh, was continued unbroken from ancient times uh, prior to the flood. And I believe that this knowledge was continued through the Knights Templar uh, right through to their uh, possession by their uh, hereditary Grand Master, Prince Henry St. Clair, in the late 1300s. And it was Prince Henry St. Clair uh, who, under the auspices of the being hereditary Grand Master, Knights Templar of Scotland at that time, sailed with 500 of his trusted knights to Nova Scotia. Well, you know what's so fascinating, endlessly fascinating to, about this to me, is that uh, I met a man in Toronto in 1998, in June of 1998, who was obviously in possession of extraordinary hidden knowledge. And I wrote a little book about this man, about my conversation. It's a transcript, really, of my conversation with him, as I remembered it, called The Key. And one of the things he said, and I know you're going to laugh as a Canadian when you hear this, uh, he said, well, I'm Canadian, but I don't pay taxes. And, uh, the, it, the implication is that he was, he must be from a, he must have been a, a Canadian, he looked European from before there was a Canada. Conceivably, a still someone of this tradition who still has all of the knowledge intact. Could would, that be true? Oh, very much so. Very much so. I've met, through my book, I've met a number of old gentlemen that all claim, <laughs> They all claim to have Canadian heritage, but the, that also note that they're not Canadian. Uh, prior to Confederation, it's, it's funny, Canadians do not realize that our country was established in 1867, just over 100 years ago. But that before that, there's a real hidden history to throughout Canada, and that hidden history includes the movement of what I believe to be the Grail family and the Grail secret inland um, to areas or surrounding the Great Lakes. And so I very much agree that there are a number of Canadians out there uh, living in Canada who have this hidden history to their family. So, so now, when you say the Grail family, explain exactly what you mean to us. The Grail family obviously picks up on what was uh, what was first released through the uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Basically, right. Lincoln and Lee obviously talk about the Grail family, the direct descendants of Jesus Christ. Uh, even if they don't exist in that form, there are certain families that I believe that possess a, not a divine right, but a, a direct connection to what I would consider to be Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. So it, it's possible that this man that I met was was in some way a, a descendant, and, and if so, this was the incredibly powerful bloodline because this man had uh, really he had the best. Uh, then there's the spiritual context. The spiritual context, I believe, relates to this notion of. The Holy Family, the Holy Grail, the uh, possible union of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, and the resulting uh, direct descendants of the uh, Holy Family, the Grail Family, as I refer to them. I think those are the two main secrets. But again, what I try to point out in my book, I don't think that this is the absolute secret. I think the absolute secret it goes beyond, goes beyond uh, to to the origin of ancient knowledge. Masonic tradition talks about the continuation, of this continual line of knowledge prior to the flood, prior to uh, Noah and the flood. Well, and I believe it's this, it's some of this knowledge that is reflected in modern ritual, although I'm being known to most Masons, uh, that is part of the secret. Give us an idea of some of this knowledge, what you think it might involve. What I think uh, one of the most important aspects of this knowledge it was the ability in ancient times, for the ancient mariners were able to establish both longitudinal and latitudinal uh, meridians around the world. And in that manner, it allowed them, uh, very much like the Greeks, to confirm that the earth was round, but also to circumnavigate the world in, as such and to trade with the uh, native Indians in both North and South America. Think about it. If you had an unlimited supply of trade, including gold and other raw minerals, which uh, lent to your steelmaking and uh, ore making abilities and gold collecting abilities, to me this would be immense wealth and immense power, something that I believe even the church would follow you around the world to try to obtain. That's fascinating. And, uh... and in my second book, that I'm working on right now, tentatively called the Grail Meridian. I believe that I've established uh, this ancient longitudinal 
um, sequence of meridians uh, across North America. And then Prince Henry Sinclair's, one of his tasks was to bring along with the uh, a variety of relics, a variety of treasures with him on his voyage in 1398, a number of chests which he would use as talismans to to reactivate this grid system across North America through the aid of the Micmac Indians. Good Lord. Now, and, and now, why do, how do the Micmac Indians come into this? Well, the Micmac Indians, or the Mi'kmaq, as they're known now, uh, were the local tribe of Indians in Nova Scotia that would have greeted uh, Prince Henry Sinclair. Now, there's a number of stories or legends. And conceivably refer- intermarried. And conceivably intermarried, very much so. I don't know. My wife is from Nova Scotia, and uh, to meet some of the Mi'kmaq Indians in Nova Scotia, you would think that they're more Scottish than Scottish. They're red-haired, blue-eyed, freckles. There, there obviously is intermarriage between the earlier Scots and, and, the, and, and, the, and the transfer, therefore, also a lot of this ancient philosophy that really couldn't have been made up, that had to come from a single origin. And this is what fascinates me. Uh, again, a moral to the book uh, is that you have to look beyond the obvious. You have to look to the origin. And uh, that origin, I believe, the, the entire secret has been lost because of the splitting of this knowledge. And there are certain clues out there within various groups, that current uh, uh, modern-day groups, that are now trying to lay claim to that they're the uh, possessors of these uh, secret uh, uh, teachings. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. The Knights Templar in the New World, How Henry Sinclair Brought the Grail to Arcadia, But more importantly, who was the grail? It was not a cup. It was a family. And that family very possibly gave us most recently the master of the key. Extraordinary stuff from William Mann. Get it from the unknowncountry.com bookstore. William Henry is making a special offer in the William Henry section of the unknowncountry.com store. Anything you buy there, any order comes with a free DVD of his incredible Stargate lecture. It's a 1995 value. It is absolutely free, one per order as long as supplies last. Buy any William Henry book or any or all of the William Henry books and you will get a free DVD thrown in. You can't beat that. It's a great offer from William Henry. So go to the unknowncountry.com store and get into William Henry. Well worth doing for your spirit and for your mind as well as for a free DVD. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back. I'm talking to Bill Mann, William Mann, the Knights Templar in the New World, how Henry Sinclair brought the grail to Arcadia. Awesome, awesome information is coming through here, folks. Uh, Maybe we're getting the key to who the master of the key was and is, and I'm thinking that maybe I'll make another trip to Canada soon and try to see if I can find him among these families that William is talking about. Now, William, before you, we left the air, we were t- you were talking about this information being split in half and the secret being lost. What exactly are the two halves? The two halves, I believe, are, one, you have to treat this on two levels. There's a physical level. Physical level, I believe, was uh, relating to a number of ancient maps, ancient maps which Knights Templar uh, possessed and which allowed them to virtually circumnavigate the world at a time when the uh, the formal church was uh, teaching that uh, you fell off the end of the earth as you passed through the pillars of Hercules. 